thanks everybody for coming down this evening. Thanks Kevin and all the folks for putting um, this mini med series together. Uh, as scientists, we, we love a good challenge, but I have to admit this is a little out of the normal depth we put ourselves in in the laboratory. We don't normally speak science in plain English, so um, it's like speaking a second language. So I apologize in advance if I use any scientific jargon. I'm going to try just speak this in my natural tongue. Um, what am I going to tell you about tonight? I'm going to tell you about how in our laboratory and in, in, in worldwide, how we're tackling cancer by targeting its, um, its blood vessels. So what I would like you to take home tonight is knowledge about the following or a little more knowledge about the following, in case you already knew. What is cancer? What are cells? What is this process we call angiogenesis? What is tailored therapy? What is drug resistance? And what are biomarkers? So let me tell you. First of all, what is cancer? The simple answer is it's a disease of cells. What are cells? Cells are the smallest unit of life. Each one of us here tonight is made up of 50 billion to trillion cells. Indeed, we start our life as the union of two cells, but I'm not going to talk about that this evening. Um, but what do, the, what, what do cells do? We've got many types of cells in, in our bodies. We've got red blood cells that carry oxygen around our blood, as Jean Piero explained. We've got nerve cells that can carry messages from our brain to distant parts of our body and back again. We've got bone cells that are so tightly packed together that we can stand upright. So these are the good guys. These are the normal cells. Um, like us, they're not all the same, but they get along and they operate as a society. They collaborate. Um, they rest or they divide as required for the need of the organism. That's, that's us, the human. Cancer cells break all the rules. Um, when something goes wrong in a single cell, it can give it a growth advantage. They divide more rigorously than normal cells. They're selfish. They prosper at the expense of their neighbors. And at the end, they destroy the whole cellular society. Another thing that cancer cells do that we're focused on in our lab is that they invade and they colonize territories where they don't belong, where healthy cells belong. So all human cancers can be generalized under, under the following hallmarks. This, these hallmarks are common to all cancers, all tumors. They invade, as I mentioned. They grow a lot. And they're subject to a process called angiogenesis, which the majority of this talk is focused on. What is angiogenesis? From the ancient Greek for angio, or angion is a vessel. And genesis it means production. So angiogenesis is the production of new blood vessels. It's not, a normal, it's not normally a disease process. This is a normal physiological process that happens in us. It's um, during embryo development or during wound healing when we, you, know, we, you cut yourself in the kitchen. We need new blood vessels to form in there so that the tissue can, can recuperate and we can grow new tissue. But it's a controlled process. You see here in the cartoon, I've got a vessel and this area here is where new blood vessel formation is required. Um, a go signal is given. Indeed, perfusion occurs, new blood vessels grow into that area, and then a stop signal occurs to shut down the angiogenic process. So it's normally very tightly controlled. Um, the field of angiogenesis, the field of vessels, owes a lot and a great deal to a man called Judah Folkman, who, in, who, in, um, who did his research in Harvard Medical School in, in Boston. And in 1971, he put out a paper so over 40 years ago, um, he kick-started this field, and he noticed that for tumors to grow from a single cell to a small bunch of cells to a large tumor mass, so a tumor is just a large mass of cancer cells, he noticed that, they, they, that tumors need to be vascularized. They need blood vessels um, to, to form a tumor. So to quote, in order to survive and grow, tumors require blood vessels that by cutting off that blood supply, a cancer could be starved into remission. So this, this kick-started in the early 70s, the idea that we could tackle cancer by targeting the blood vessels, not by targeting the cancer cells themselves, but by our own blood vessels that the tumor has involved so that it can grow. So it wasn't until um, the 80s that what this, um, the factors were that control this process were identified, and it wasn't until 2004 that we actually had a drug on the market that we could target against cancer vessels. So just to give you an idea there, it's 40 years from discovery to, to, to the actual clinic. Um, so it is a long process, but we owe a great deal to Judith Folkman. 
So I've got a movie also. Um, it will play. It will play. So I have a movie that would have shown you how tumors secrete factors that attract in new blood vessels. Luckily, I've summarized it on the following slide. The movie was fantastic. Um, <laughs> essentially, what the movie would have shown you is that what tumors do, when tumors need to grow from a small bunch of cells to a large mass, they send a signal out to bring in new blood vessels. These signals are called angiogenic factors. They're factors that are responsible for angiogenesis. So there, in the cartoon on the right there, there are the little green circles that are coming away from the tumor. Tumor angiogenesis factors bind our normal blood vessels and, and tell them to form new blood vessels that grow towards the tumor. So they stimulate new blood vessel formation in number two. You can see the tumor is growing in size. So why do tumors need blood vessels? Why do any part of our body need blood vessels? It's to supply nutrients and to supply oxygen. And when the tumor acquires nutrients and oxygen, it can grow and grow. Unfortunately, this is also a route of spread for the tumors. Um, so they've, they're now got a healthy blood supply, so they can also now use it as an escape route to get from a primary tumor from a primary location to a secondary location. This is a process we call metastasis. So you can see angiogenesis, which is common to all tumors, is an extremely attractive target for therapeutic intervention so that we can, we, we want to shut this down. So what has happened in the, 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 the 40 plus years since Judah Folkman published his first work is the field has, has rapidly grown and developed. And we've developed, we, not me, the greater communi scientific community, have developed anti-angiogenic drugs to target this process. So one of these anti-angiogenic drugs I'm going to tell you about is called Avastin. That's what it looks like. And the pro-angiogenic factor that it targets is called VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor. So this is a factor, as you see in the cartoon on the right, that's secreted. It's, tumors release this. So what, what Avastin does is it blocks VEGF from doing its job. So I'm going to tell you three stories tonight about three different cancers and how we're looking to improve the performance of these anti-angiogenic drugs in these three different cancers. So the first story I'm going to tell you is about bowel cancer or colon cancer. And we're looking to predict who will respond to Avastin because not everybody responds. The second story I'm going to tell you about is, uh, is about kidney cancer and how we're looking to predict what patients are likely to be subject to certain side effects that these drugs give off. And the third and final story is about a brain tumor where we're looking to improve the performance of Avastin in the, in the treatment of brain cancer. So the first story centers around bowel cancer. This project is called AngioPredict. Bowel cancer or colorectal cancer is cancer of the large bowel or the large intestine. In Europe, it affects um, 450,000 citizens every year. Um, unfortunately, more than half of those people um, will die of the disease. And Ireland is obviously has, has a, quite a high incidence of this disease. Now, the drug Avastin for metastatic colon cancer, so cancer that's at the advanced stage that has spread, offers a short increase in survival. This graph shows the survival, the average survival of patients on chemotherapy alone on top. And when we add Avastin to, to that treatment, these patients, I mean, it's four or five months. It's not, it's not, it's, it, we would like to see a better improvement in survival. Now, I said this is average survival. So obviously some patients live longer and respond more, and some patients don't respond as much as, much at all and will be much further to the left. So we want a tool to predict what patients is it worthwhile giving this drug and what patients should be spared from this drug. So the reason some tumors or some cancers respond to any drug, including anti-angiogenics, is because of what's called drug resistance. They become resistant. And how a way to explain drug resistance is to use an aerial photograph of our fair city. Um, so there's two people on this map. Let's say you're the guy in the red here in the bottom down by Trinity College and you want to meet your friend for lunch up by the spire. And um, the obvious route is, of course, O'Connell Bridge. But what if there was a taxi driver strike on O'Connell Bridge and you couldn't get over there. Um, well, a lot of people, you know, would turn back, um, but not everybody, you know. You, you have a knowledge of the city, you know, you can go up and across Haypenny Bridge or across Butt Bridge. Um, unfortunately for us, when we block angiogenesis in tumors, 
a lot of the tumours don't turn back. They find an alternative route um, to, to make angiogenesis happen. Now, we wish tumours were as two-dimensional, as simple as, 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 as Dublin, but they're far more complex. So we're only beginning to understand how complex they are, um, but tumours, unfortunately, find a way to work around um, these therapies that, that we're using. So this is where we're going from historically and where we want to move away from is this cartoon here of, of um, apologies, this cartoon here of, of, um, of people in the middle wearing different colored clothing um, that, that helps us distinguish them here. Historically, all these people would have been given the same diagnosis and therefore the same treatment because our tools are, are a little old fashioned. Um, so we only want to give the drug to this bottom right group here. These are people where there's no toxicity. What I mean by that is there's no side effects um, and that it, it's of benefit to these patients. We only, so we only want to give it to the patients who are going to benefit and who have as little side effects as possible. We don't want to give it to the people on the top right um, where the drug is actually has toxic side effects and it's of no benefit. Um, we don't want to give it to the people on the top, on the top left where the drug is toxic but also has a benefit. We need to, we need to balance these things um, and we definitely don't want to give it to, to the people on the bottom left um, who, where the drug is, 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 is not toxic and, and of no benefit either. So this brings us into one of the words from the title slide is tailored therapy. Not all patients are the same, we're not all the same, and not all cancers are the same. And we're realizing that um, as the years go by. So what we need are tools to predict to differentiate these patients. They don't come into the clinic wearing different colored clothes so we can't easily tell these apart. We need tools to make a precise diagnosis so we can tailor the right treatment to the right patient and we can re reduce side effects. We don't want to give these drugs to patients who are likely to develop side effects. So we want to reduce the side effects and increase the benefit. And these tools are what we call biomarkers. Uh, what is a biomarker? It's a biological marker. So it's something that we can objectively and precisely, precisely measure. So something that when we measure it in the pathology lab in the hospital or wherever in the hospital, that we know what it's saying is, is what's actually happening in that person. Um, and we can measure it precisely. Every time we go to measure it, we get the same result. It can reflect a normal process or it can reflect a disease process. Um, or it can, as in our case, it can reflect a, a, a response to a treatment. So biomarkers can be anything. They can be images. So an, an X-ray is a biomarker. An, an MRI scan or a CAT scan can be used as a biomarker to tell the doctor that you do or don't have this, or you will or won't respond to this drug. Um, blood pressure is a biomarker. It, it, it tells the, the, your doctor, are you responding to something? Do you need to be taken off a drug? Or typically when we think of biomarkers, we think of substances in the blood or in the urine. So the project AngioPredict is funded by the European Commission and the, the, the EU. And the aim is, as I said, with colorectal cancer is to predict who will and who will not respond to Avastin. Um, so what we want here is a predictive biomarker. And the question we're asking is who will benefit from the treatment? So this involves a lot of people. This involves collaboration between industry and academia across Europe. Um, my boss in Epburn, who um, cannot be here this evening is the coordinator of this grant. And this, the design with AngioPredict is to start off with a clinical trial. And what we intend to do is recruit over 200 patients with colorectal cancer at, at late stage. So it's, it's locally advanced or it's metastatic. And these patients will be subdivided into two groups. One group will get Avastin and one group will not get Avastin. Um, blood and tissue biopsies are going to be collected before during and after the, after the um, treatment. And just as a plug, this trial is open and recruiting. Um, uh, so if anybody knows of anybody who would like to get involved, it's accessible through all cancer centers in the country. Um, obviously, you'll have access to these slides. I'm here afterwards. Um, my email's on here. This is being run in conjunction with, with ICORG in Ireland, um, who run all the cancer clinical trials. So just a slide on, on how the, this, this, this study has been designed. So we're here at, at stage one, we're collecting samples um, from patients who are treated with Avastin or without Avastin. And we're gonna ask a sim simple question, do they respond or do they not respond? And we're, we're gonna collect, because we're collecting blood, we can link that response with their genetics. So we can look at a person's genetics and we can say, if the people who respond all have this 
genetic signature. The people who don't respond all have this genetic signature. And then what we'll do is a, a prospective clinical trial where we'll validate this. So we'll take our signature in the clinic, patients will be recruited into a new clinical trial, and we'll, we'll, we'll now have our, we'll, we'll be equipped with a signature, a biomarker, and we'll be able to say, do they respond or do they not respond? And that will validate our signature, which is a very important step to validate the biomarker to say, this is, this is really happening. So as I said earlier, a biomarker needs to be precise and, and objective. And if, if indeed it works, we will have a, we'll develop a kit that, can be, that, that all pathology labs in the country and indeed worldwide can be equipped with to predict what patients with metastatic colorectal cancer will, predict to, will respond to Avastin. So the second part of my presentation centers around um, renal cell cancer or kidney cancer. And what we're aiming to do here, this project is called Angiotox. We're aiming to predict what patients will, will, will develop side effects associated with this drug. So the drug is called Sutent. It's also an, an, an anti-angiogenic drug um, for, for the treatment of kidney cancer, and it prolongs the survival of these patients. It's, it's currently under study in early stage clinical trials for breast, colorectal, or, or bowel, and lung cancer, so it's, it's gonna be coming into the clinic more and more. Unfortunately, a lot of patients on this drug develop side effects, um, such as high blood pressure and decreased heart function. And not all patients do, some do, some don't. So this project has been, has been established called Angiotox. Again, it's funded by the European Union, uh, and Epburn is the coordinator also. What we want here is a safety biomarker. We want to predict, is this drug safe to use in, 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 in this patient, or is, is it not safe to use in another patient? So we want to be able to predict what patients should be taken off the drug or should not be put on the drug in the first place. Again, it involves a collaboration between academics and industrial partners um, across Europe and Canada in this setting. So I'll just tell you how this trial is designed. Um, normally in the clinic, patients are given Sutent, they experience side effects, but we don't know how, and we cannot predict these side effects. The only decision we do is to take them off the drug. So um, we would like to, at an earlier stage, to decide whether they should be going on this drug or not. They shouldn't be going to the stage of developing heart toxicity, their side effects of the heart, and we would like to spur them um, going that far. So what we do is a, in parallel, um, we treat lab animals, we treat mice with the same dose, um, obviously a lot, totally, in total a lot less drug. And this, um, we aim to observe the same side effects. So we want, we want we, we, ideally the mice have high blood pressure. Um, and this will allow us to understand how this is happening, what, what's the mechanism, and hopefully will allow us to predict in whom this is going to happen. So this study is ongoing now for a couple of years, and what we did find is that mice are a good model to mimic humans who are on Sutent. These mice do get high blood pressure. Their hearts are not functioning well. Um, we, we've removed tissue then post-mortem, and we're, we're analyzing that tissue to find out why this is happening. But what about a predictive biomarker? Well, what we can do in humans, we can all, generally always do in mice. Um, I don't know if anybody here has ever had a PET scan, but we have a, a PET pet scan for, for mice. Um, so we, we can, what a pet scan involves is uh, the injection of uh, a safe level of radioactive tracers. These are a sugar with a radioactive tag on there. So it's injected in and where the sugar is absorbed or metabolized in your body, it gives off a, a light, it gives off a signal and we can, we, can, we can measure the metabolism of that sugar. And we can do exactly that in our, in our mice. Um, I'm not going to, this talk is not going to be data heavy, so this is, I think, the only piece of data. In this part, um, I hope you can appreciate, this is looking at the, the animal's heart from the top. So we're looking at the ventricle from the very top, that in the animals treated with Sutent, that they're, they're using a lot more sugar. This, this, this is telling us that their hearts are a lot more stressed out, their metabolism is totally changed. What we like about this is that it's a non-invasive way to predict these toxic side effects happening with this drug. We don't need to, you know, we don't need to, the, the animals are, are alert so, and humans are alert during a PET scan. We don't need to perform a biopsy. So this is a nice, novel safety biomarker to tell us that patients are going on to respond, to, to, to have side effects. So that is the next step, is to move this back into the clinic and to perform PET scans on patients who are on this drug and see, do patients who develop these toxicities of the heart, 
have altered metabolisms of sugars in their heart when we, when we perform PET scans on them. So the third and final part of the study is focused on, on brain cancer, where we're trying to improve the performance of the drug Avastin, the anti-angiogenic in, in brain cancer. The brain cancer we're focused on is called glioblastoma. Um, it affects globally about 300,000 people annually. Um, that's about the population of, of County Galway, just to put that in context. There is no cure for this disease. Everybody who gets it will die of it um, approximately 14 months after their diagnosis. So that's, this is what motivates us to, to tackle this cancer. Um, glioblastomas are one of the most vascularized cancers in the human body. They are very dense with blood vessels. They've got a very great, they've got an, a really high supply of blood vessels, which makes, then it makes perfect sense to use the drug of Aston on, to treat them. And indeed the drug of Aston prolongs survival and improves quality of life um, for these patients. Um, but however, there's been a few cases where the drug of Aston has been reported to actually increase the invasion of these cells. Remember I told you invasion is a hallmark of cancer it invades parts of, of the body, in this case, parts of the brain where it doesn't belong. This is an MRI scan of this person's brain before they were treated with Avastin. And then nine months later, I hope you can appreciate it, you can see this white region is the tumor has spread to the other hemisphere, the other side of the brain, and it's appearing here now in the back of the brain. So yes, targeting with an anti-angiogenic makes sense because there's so much angiogenesis, there's so much blood vessel formation but now we have a peculiar side effect of treating with this drug in that we're making the cells invade more. So why is invasion a problem? This map is a fictitious uh, warmongering country invading its neighbours. Um, when countries invade other countries, it does so at the detriment of those countries. Um, when cancer invades normal, healthy parts of the brain, it does so at the detriment of, that, of, of those parts of the brain. The brain cannot function. So we, in the laboratory, stand around and we scratch our head a lot and we, we ask, what's the difference between cancer cells that don't invade, which is what we want, and cancer cells that do invade? And we, our goal is, if we, have, if we can understand this difference more, we can develop treatments, we can develop new drugs to target that difference, to target the invasive part of this cancer. So we want to stop it, so we could, I mean, ideally drug what makes it invasive and revert, stop this process in its steps. So what we did, we compared tissue from, from 19 patients who had glioblastoma from the edge of the tumour, the invasive part of the tumour, versus the core of the tumour, the part of the tumour that's not invading. Um, we identified certain targets, certain proteins, that there was a great deal more of them at the invasive edge than the core of the tumour. This graph here just shows the levels of one of our targets. You can see on the bar chart, at the edge of the tumour, there's a lot more of this target being made than in the core. So our theory is, maybe this target is involved in helping these tumours invade. So this cartoon just shows you in the laboratory, when we step away from the clinic, how we can mimic invasion and measure invasion. So these are glioblastoma cells, it's a, it's a cartoon, and we can challenge them to invade through a matrix, um, and we can, we can, over time, and we can watch them invade, and we can take a photograph, and we can stain them, um, and we can count them. But what we can also do our target that we identified, we can interfere with its production, we can remove it from the glioblastoma cells and ask the question, when we take it away from cancer cells, what happens? If it's, if it's so important for cancer cell invasion, perhaps when we take it out of the cancer cells, they don't invade less. So I've, I've, to illustrate this, there are little green dots are our target. In these cells, we've removed them. These, these are glioblastoma cells that are, 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 don't have our target in. And again, it's only a cartoon, the photograph is real, the, the glioblastoma cells invade less in the laboratory when we remove our target that we identified to be that our invasive cells were making a lot more of. And we can count those and put it in a bar chart and, and present it. Um, but I think the photos speak, speak more. There's definitely less glioblastoma cells invading when we take away our target. So to go back to our hallmarks, we're now quite confident that we're, we can tackle this disease using Avastin to tackle angi angiogenesis and we found something that's important for invasion, so we need to make a drug against it to tackle invasion. So how do we do this? We use what's called nanotherapy. Um, what is nanotherapy? What is, nanotherapy exists on what's called a nanoscale, so we're gonna start with a schlitter with the Galway crest on it to make up for 
their bad treatment earlier in this talk. Um, a slit there is about 10 centimeters, which is about 100 times greater than the width of a, a one cent coin, which is about 10 times greater than the width of a typical human hair, which is about 10 times greater than a typical human cell. So we're down to, we're down to the micrometer scale here. And a typical virus is about 100 times smaller than a human cell. And it's down there, that's the nanoscale, very small indeed, is, is the take home message. Why are we making drugs at that level? It has certain benefits. First thing, we can target these drugs to just the tumor. Um, so they only arrive at where they belong and they don't arrive at other tissues around the body like, like classical chemotherapy would. This cartoon here just shows a nanotherapy, a nanoparticle we call them, and the drug is packaged up inside it. And this is a tumor in the cartoon. And you can see the drug is only arriving at the tumor and not at local normal tissue. So you know, we're, we're getting it where we want and that should reduce side effects. Because it's smaller, you actually get more uptake and it's cleared slower from the body because it's smaller. So for those reasons, you have greater effects and longer lasting effects. And from a patient perspective, um, that's, that's, that's attractive. It means administration is less frequent. These patients need to be in the clinic less frequent. So there's many nanotherapies um, currently FDA approved and, and in, in clinical trials. So we made our nanotherapy against our target, and now in the laboratory, we can grow glioblastoma tumors in the brains of mice, and we have engineered these tumors to glow. So we can, in real time, in live animals, we can watch our tumors grow. So we don't have to sacrifice animals, we can just put the animals in a machine and we can see these little heat maps here. We can get an estimate of how much our tumor is growing. So let me talk you through this graph here. This, again, is survival of animals. When we don't treat these mice who have glioblastoma tumors, they succumb to the disease at about 80 days after they, they acquire the disease. When we treat with our nanoparticle alone that targets our target, that is important for invasion, we don't see an improvement in survival. But when we treat with Avastin alone, this is the anti-angiogenic drug, we see a short increase in survival. It equates to about 10% in these animals. But when we combine our anti-angiogenic with our anti-invasion <coughs> nanotherapy, we get a prolonged survival that equates to about 25%. Now this is a pilot study, you know, we're excited about it. 25% um, in a patient who's living for 14 months is, a, is about three to four months, so it's, it's, it's significant, I'm sure, to them. We're not finished, we're, we're performing more studies currently in the lab to, to fine-tune this and to hopefully get a better effect um, in animals before we move into the clinic. Um, so we've developed our nanotherapy. We're currently working with uh, technology transfer here in RCSI to put a patent on it. So we're, we're serious about getting this into the glioblastoma clinic. So I'll summarize my three stories and then uh, um, I'll take questions. I told you about the AngioPredict project where our aim is to predict response to Avastin in patients with metastatic colorectal cancer. And I told you about the prospective clinical trial that's ongoing. I told you about the AngioTox project where we, are, are hope we, are, we have equipped ourselves with a safety biomarker in the PET scan um, to predict these side effects that are happening in the hearts of patients. Um, and I told you about our nanotherapy approach where we're looking at the brain tumor glioblastoma. Um, where we've combined an anti-angiogenic with an anti-invasion therapy in animals and are seeing promising results. So the future for us and for the field of angiogenesis research in cancer is all about improving the therapeutic benefit of anti-angiogenic drugs. So that'll be done by treating only the patients who respond. So it'll be done by treating patients who won't get toxic side effects, and it will be done by combining it perhaps with an anti-invasion therapy. This is the first slide from earlier. I, think you've, I, I hope you've, you've learned a little more about, about these words here. Um, I told you how, how drug resistance is a problem in cancer cells. Um, to, to angiogenics and how we've developed biomarkers so that we can tailor therapy towards these patients. I'd like to thank Annette Byrne, who can't be here tonight. She's the principal investigator on, on angiotox and angiopredict. Um, I would like to thank all these names. I'm not going to list them out. Um, but I talked earlier about a healthy society. This is a healthy society of people working together and getting along. So I thank them for getting along. Um, I'd like to thank Kevin and Maria um, at Minimed for putting this together. I think it's fantastic. I think you're entitled to hear what we're doing and we're obliged to, to tell you what we're doing. 
you'll notice this funding isn't private, it's, it's exchequer funding, so I think we, we, as scientists we're obliged to inform you what we're at. I'd like to thank the patients. I, I'd be out of a job if patients didn't participate in studies and clinical trials and donate tissues and bloods. Um, all our discoveries start with patients. We move into the lab and then we move back to patients. So we're extremely grateful to them. Thanks for listening. I'll take any questions. The main thing is to understand what the process of angiogenesis is. That's the formation of new blood vessels in a cancer. And uh, the second part to what I'd like to take home is that, that we're developing drugs to target new blood vessel formation. Um, we're managing to predict what patients will respond to these drugs, will not respond, with which patients will get toxic side effects and, and which will not. So I suppose to be aware of the field of, of angiogenesis and of drugs that target that process. Uh, very interesting, uh, nice overview on the general approaches. Uh, some aspects of cancer I wasn't um, really aware of myself having not been in the cancer research background mm -hmm. myself. So um, a good overview and in layman's terms, which was a nice new way for a scientific lecture, I thought. Uh, I found it very interesting. Uh, I, I found it very easy to understand them. They're in areas which I don't have a vast amount of expertise, but I found the whole thing very easy to understand and interesting. And I, I, I felt I actually learned kind of a lot out of it, coming in from it with not working in the area or, or having any actually kind of specialised knowledge of them.